HBCU Digest, and we're back um, on this particular interview. I can't. Uh, I have to I have to disclose bias. This is um, <laughs> one of five Omega Men uh, that I, I, I love uh, in this world. Um, our brother who is who supported the digest uh from day one, um, and who truly truly is a role model for the HBC community, Nicholas Perkins, the CEO and president of the Perkins Management Services Incorporated, uh, proud graduate of Fayetteville State University, who is celebrating 15 years in business doing business years. with black folks, <laughs> that's right, that's right, doing business with black folks and for black folks. Um, in a powerful way. So, my brother, um, it is always an honor to have you on, man. Thank you, man. I'm just honored for me to be here, brother. So 15 years, man. T talk talk about years. it, man. 15 it's, years. You and I got great, got great coming in the face. I'm telling you, man, 15 <laughs> years to do that to you. <laughs> for so sure. talk, talk, about, talk about the journey, man. Um, this started from a one man operation to a multi million dollar uh, multi state operation. So just, just share with people who are looking at this. And hoping to follow in your footsteps, what that journey has been like. Well, it uh, it's been it's been a, an honor, man. We've been truly blessed to uh, have had the opportunity to have the experiences that we've had, you know, as a company. Uh, it does not seem like it's been 15 years uh, since we began, you know, operations. And I have to tell you, you know, um, I incorporated this company uh, 16 years ago uh, this November, but we began operations. Uh, October the 15th, 2015. So on tomorrow, we'll officially will be the 15th anniversary of, uh, of Perkins Management Services. And, um, you know, I just feel very blessed to have, um, you know, had the opportunity to experience the growth that we have over the years, uh, a partner with some of the tremendous clients and have had the opportunity to serve uh, many of our nation's historically black college and universities, uh, partner with the federal government, uh, serviced uh, the Environmental Protection Agency, the United States Department of Transportation, uh, the uh, United States Department of Homeland Security, uh, the Department of Army, um, the Defense Health Organization. I mean, it's just been a, 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 such a tremendous ride and to think uh, you know, that uh, this all started, you know, 15 years ago uh, in Cumberland County in Fayetteville, North Carolina, with one, you know, mental health institution where I was the cook, the cashier, the um, the the janitor uh, and the food delivery guy, you know, and uh, to see where the company has grown. Uh, I can attribute that to nothing but uh, the grace of God, to be honest with you. Man, for those of us who are trying to follow in your footsteps and to build um, a, a truly healthy and thriving black owned organization. Yes. Um, you know, you and I and most black folks are aware of the challenges that black vendors and black entrepreneurs face. But how have you been able to successfully navigate those to get in places where you're doing business, not only just in our communities, but as you mentioned, with the federal government, with state agencies? What do you think has been one of the key ingredients to you being able to to transition between vendor opportunities and entrepreneurial opportunities? Well, I've always tried to keep my head on the swivel, as my football coach would teach us, uh, and always uh, constantly looking uh, for opportunities. Uh, and I've never been afraid to go outside of uh, my comfort zone. And, uh, you know, being from a small town in Fayetteville, North Carolina, you you know, uh, I was a little nervous in the beginning, you know, to travel out and go to all these different states. And, uh, you know, we really started. I mean, when we really after our first contract, we were really a, a, a multi-state operator. I mean, you know, we I've gone to Chicago to, uh, you know, to Kentucky, Tennessee, you know, um, Florida, you know, and, and these were the early stages of our business because I was wasn't intimidated uh, about, you know, going to find, you know, where the opportunities may be. And so I would always encourage, you know, people to think outside of the box, find out where the opportunities are and go get them because, you know, it's not going to come to you. You know, you got to go and get it right. And especially uh, in our community, sometimes those opportunities, you know, um, you know, we, we aren't necessarily always, you know, presently where we are. We have to identify them and then go wherever they are and have the courage in order to be able to go out and do that. One of the distinguished parts of your career, particularly with HBCUs, is that you've been a, a, 
a multi-million dollar philanthropist um, at your alma mater and other institutions. You have taught at institutions. You've established uh, professional development than money. And I don't say that in a funny way, but I'm not only in your pockets, but mm -hmm. into the institutions on students to get them prepared for the next level of their lives. What is what has really induced you to say, I want to be multifaceted in the way that HBCUs are preparing these young people? Well, you know, I thought that it was it was vitally important uh, for me to as I continue to grow and develop and, and as an entrepreneur to reach back to younger generations of uh, aspiring uh, entrepreneurs because I have always felt like entrepreneurship was the way for people of color, especially in the United States. Uh, the racial wealth gap uh, has plagued us and continues to, uh, to plague us uh, gr far greater than uh, any other uh, race or ethnicity. Uh, in the United States. And I have always felt like that entrepreneurship was the fastest way for African-American people ultimately to be able to narrow the racial wealth gap and to be able to create generational wealth and transfer that wealth um, uh, to uh, for, for future generations. And so in order, uh, because in, in many times, you know, I was almost like a unicorn, you know, so I would show up, you know, and I started this business. I was 25 years old and, you know, I'm coming to get the largest contract on campus or the largest co uh, contract on the base. And I was a very young person. I was very confident, naive in some aspects. Uh, but at the same time, you know, um, you know, I was bold enough to do that, but people were not accustomed to seeing young African-American uh, men and women uh, come to do business. And what I wanted to do was to encourage, um, you know, other young people that, hey, you can go out and do this. So uh, that's why I went into the classroom and I'm going into, I think, my either third or fourth year uh, teaching at Howard University. Uh, I teach entrepreneurship there. Uh, and I taught uh, entrepreneur, entrepreneurial thinking and creativity and entrepreneurship, uh, you know, for Fayetteville State as well. Um, but um, it, I mean, it's just a tremendous uh, pleasure for me, really, to uh, teach. And I probably taught, gosh, you know, they give me an auditorium over there, man. My class mm -hmm. is, uh, is always packed. You know, uh, and I've, you know, had an opportunity to interact with uh, some of the most brilliant minds, you know, and uh, I, I think that uh, we are going to see some uh, tremendous uh, entrepreneurs to come, you know, in the next decade or so, uh, because, I mean, they're they're fearless, you know, they're, they're brilliant um, and uh, they really want to do something about uh, narrowing uh, the racial wealth gap in America. Let's talk about that because you you not only teach about that, but you you're also a radio host. Mm -hmm. You talked about that wealth gap. You talked about opportunities for Black entrepreneurs at length and unafraid. Um, wh when you look at what the, the urgency for for Black folks, particularly in 2020, as we think yeah. about the social political climate, mm -hmm. how can is, is there a way to expedite the way that we think about business and getting people ready to do business? particularly as resources and politics are changing and, and and for as little money as we had in our communities before it looks like it's gonna it's gonna be even less because of job loss and how banks and industries are are, are shifting to try to deal with this thing yeah is, is there a way to, to stay on track with that or is it like this does it feel to you like this is a pause button moment for black folks until the country learns how to manage the virus well, now more than ever, uh, is, is it urgent that uh, the real entrepreneurs stand up and find a way to go out and find the new opportunities? Because uh, these unfortunate set of circumstances that we are under now uh, have caused a tremendous amount of, of heartache and, and pain and devastation in not only the African-American community, but just the country as a whole. But there has to be a period of rebuilding and sifting through the ashes. We are going to find that there are opportunities. And uh, now more than ever, in my opinion, do we need entrepreneurs uh, to go out and create 
uh, new jobs. And I believe that uh, uh, those who have the courage enough uh, now to uh, go out and try to establish new businesses and, and, and sift through the ashes again and find uh, where the new opportunities are, are going to see uh, that there is going to be a tremendous amount of wealth on the other side of this um uh you know this unfortunate set of circumstances that the pandemic has brought but uh i think we have to have a very optimistic view uh about the future uh and i believe that uh, now more than ever it's needed uh, you began to see uh banks like jp morgan and others who have stepped up and uh put forward uh, uh initiatives uh, that are geared toward narrowing the racial wealth gap and i believe that african-american entrepreneurs should hold their feet to the fire in many ways uh and make sure that it becomes real uh and uh you know not only them uh, uh bb t now truest also has initiatives uh, around uh minorities and m communities and minority business initiatives and uh so you know you see uh now more than I have ever really seen uh, a very strong stance taken by the banking industry uh, to do something about wealth inequality in America, because, I mean, it is uh, one of our most uh, present and prevailing issues uh, that have adversely affected our community. So, you know, you have to, the pandemic uh, has been devastating. Uh, it has had devastating effects on our business, including mine. Uh, but, uh, you know, we have had no other choice, Ben, but to push through. And uh, I think that you will see that people who have persisted through this, when they make it uh, out on the other side, will have ad identified opportunities uh, to be able to grow and diversify. Uh, and, and to be honest with you, many of us would not probably have considered uh the diversification that we have had to have we not been faced with this challenge and i think this challenge has uh tested uh um uh, much of our metal uh and uh you know has forced us to think uh through things a bit differently do you think that the period of engagement with black america is sustainable um because as happy as i am to see hbcus getting a lot of philanthropic opportunities and a lot of black folks saying, I want to enroll in an HBCU. I want to think about an HBCU, athletics, academics, all across the board. Black folks are falling in love again with black colleges. Mm -hmm. but at the same time, we remember that the catalyst for this is a brother getting his neck kneed on. Sure. Right. And, mm -hmm. and we know that the catalyst for this is uh, a global pandemic. So you're talking about dangerous stuff that makes people pay attention to black people. I am worried. I am worried, bro. Like this mm -hmm. is at some point people will will forget about those things. Do you think that that do you agree with that or do you think that this is something that will keep lasting as long as black folks keep saying, no, no, don't don't forget about us now. Like, you know, yeah, we still well, here. that's a good point. Um, you know, uh, unfortunately, man, you know, uh, it has taken circumstances like this tragedy uh, that happened to George Floyd and uh, the injustice uh, that we see and the tragedy uh, that, that, that happened uh, to Breonna Taylor and you know the rash of civil unrest, uh, social unrest all across the country uh, pertaining to uh, uh, you know uh, racial, uh, and, and, and wealth inequality. You know, Martin Luther King uh, told us that uh, a riots are uh, the language of the unheard. And, yep. and that's so very true. And uh, it takes sometimes unfortunate circumstances like this for people to really begin to pay attention to uh, the adverse impact that people of color have had to deal with as a result of uh, discrimination. Uh, and unfortunately, it can be found in just about every way uh, of American life, uh, unfortunately. Uh, and it does appear that the African-American community now more than ever is awake. But, uh, you know, we have in some ways gotten a bit detached from our past and i and for some strange reason and i'm not really sure uh how we could have ever felt as if uh we have uh 
you know, arrived or we were on this level and equal playing field, um, you know, with uh, majority communities because we, we aren't and we have we have never been. And I think for the first time, uh, our country is having, well, I won't say for the first time, I'll say for the second time, our country yeah. is having to deal with the issue of race. And in this, uh, what I call a follow on civil rights movement, is in my opinion um having forcing the country to have to have a real conversation uh about race and the adverse impact of uh discrimination uh in our in our country and 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 so when you see a financial giants coming out and saying okay hey you know, enough is enough. This isn't right. Look at where African American uh, wealth uh, is in the country right now. You know, this isn't good for anybody. But you know, we from you know most oftentimes have been viewed you know just as consumers. You know, um, and you know, we we aren't building any wealth. You know, we we are almost like the gas uh, that you put in the car. You know, it can't go without us. Mm -hmm. Our economy cannot go without African-American people. My students did a case study, it was brilliant, on the adverse impact of um, uh, segregation. Uh, and we saw, you know, how we measured the, the net worth of African-Americans and African-American businesses during that period versus periods post-integration. Mm -hmm. uh, we learned uh, that in more recent times, uh, we generate a trillion dollars a year, and yet we are still uh, the most discriminated against, disenfranchised group, and and still have a negative or uh, approaching a negative net worth collectively, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and, it, and that that just doesn't make sense, right? Uh, and um, you know, so we have to realize that ultimately we can control that. And we we are in a country that, that there is a great deal of opportunity. And I've never seen a massive restructuring of uh, the tax system to benefit uh, a poor and middle class people. So we, we're not going to catch up wealth that way. Right. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. in, in, in many instances, you know, you look at our system. I mean, it's it's set up on inequality and, and avarice, to be honest with you. So, I mean, we, we have to look towards uh, things like entrepreneurship to do something about this racial wealth gap in America. And I, and I believe that, um, you know, it is, you know, we have a global pandemic, right? But from a, a, a micro environment, the African-American community has another pandemic that is dealing with, and that's wealth inequality. So let's talk about how we manage that, right? Because you and I have talked privately over mm -hmm. the years about the, the frustration um, to put it to put it nicely, mm -hmm. that we work with some black folks who really get it, and they say we got to do more to empower black entrepreneurs, black media, black everything. How can we be an HBCU and not do that? And then there are some institutions that do the exact opposite, mm -hmm. almost to the point that sometimes they'll try to sabotage you. Sure, um, is that something that you you do you feel as as a businessman? that we can change, help to change that culture? Or do you just have to hope and pray that people that we do business with, particularly African-Americans are just, they're, they're woke enough to understand building a, an ecosystem of business. And you know, it's just something that I've never really quite understood. Um, I tell you, I, again, I say that I was a bit naive whenever I started. I, I initially thought that once I came out here with 100 percent minority owned food service management company, that I was going to automatically be embraced. Um, and, you know, it was a, a, a bit of a, a shock to me, uh, you know, what I encountered, um, you know, and the perception uh, in and around uh, what it meant to do business with a minority uh, and, you know, the perceptions that followed and were associated uh, with being doing business with a black owned company. And uh, most of these, um, you know, generalizations uh, had come from 
uh, previous experiences that people may have had with uh, doing business with uh, our, our black owned companies at some point, you know, during their career. And, uh, you know, and I'm, I'm always a student first. So I studied a lot of that and realized that uh, we that, that even during those early times, especially in the 70s, when you saw minority business programs kicking in and this this wave of, of, of black entrepreneurship come through, even during those periods, our companies were never really fully capitalized. Right. Mm -hmm. So we e even the, the, the minority owned businesses during that period never really had all that they needed in order to be able to scale and be able to deliver services uh, by comparison to their white competitors. And so, you know, HBCUs especially all always often always complain about that. I have that same argument, right? That, um, you know, it, it's unfair to uh, measure them against their white counterparts when their white counterparts are often uh, funded, um, you know, at higher levels than they have been, but yet, you know, have uh, performed in many ways uh, much better, doing more with less. And I think we've all mastered that, right? But, uh, you know, my experience ultimately uh, has been that, uh, you know, I have been blessed to have done business with, you know, a tremendous amount of clients, both uh, uh, state and, and private. And um, the clients that I have uh, had the most success with and the relationships have been the best with uh, have been those that are student centric, uh, student focused uh, institutions. And with presidents that, um, you know, had a very clear expectation of, you know, what they wanted from their vendor partners uh, and controlled, uh, you know, their business and finance people. You know, mm -hmm. what I've determined is oftentimes that uh, uh, sometimes uh, if the, 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 the chief financial officer uh, mm -hmm. at, at many uh, uh, institutions, uh, can make or break those vendor relationships, um, you know, and uh, a presidents that, uh, you know, have a good handle on that, uh, I think are the institutions that we see that, uh, that thrive, you know, uh, and, um, you know, um, it's, a, it's a highly political space uh, that I operate in, uh, oftentimes doesn't really have much to do with food at all. Um, you know, you know, you know, me starting a brand, you know, from scratch, that's, that's Perkins, um, you know, and many people have not had an opportunity to see uh, someone build a company uh, from the ground up. And uh, it's never really an apples to apples comparison, because if you look at my competitors and where they were at their 15th year, uh, they aren't what well, they were not then what they are now. But mm -hmm. someone somewhere gave them an opportunity and were patient enough with them uh, to allow them to be able to grow and to scale and to acquire other businesses and grow into the uh, multi-billion, multinational corporations that they are now. Uh, mm -hmm. But it's often always easy to say, you know, um, look at where we are now. But most of the people who were alone during the times for which these companies were growing and scaling have, have transitioned on to the other side. So they're not here to tell the stories. Mm -hmm. uh, but, um, you know, I look around and, and see, um, you know, some of the, the, the larger companies and some of the uh, strategies that they use to, uh, you know, gain traction in the HBCU world to me is something that I would never do. Um, you know, you know, I, I consider myself to be an entrepreneur, but I and, and a business person. Uh, but uh, I've always respected, um, you know, my clients and uh, potential clients enough to present Nicholas Perkins and Perkins Management uh, as an independent firm. And that's the most the thing that I'm the most proud of is that I've been able to over the past 15 years maintain that independence uh, as I've continued to grow. Uh, my company and um, you know we, we've had some bumps along the road and you know uh, you know we, we weren't perfect you know uh, but uh, but we survived you know to be able to to live and, and fight and compete another day and uh, I think uh, you know and and that's to be said about about a number of, uh, of companies because you know we've had to hang in there with uh, with our client partners and, and as much as if not more than uh, they've hung in there with us. Mm -hmm. 
You don't want to talk me not to sell out to the white man. Um, nah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I well, you know, know, some people don't. Some people don't see it that way. You yeah. know, some some people don't. Some people don't uh, don't see that that way. You know, uh, but it's always been uh, uh, something to me to want to be able to, um, you know, to to own and control my own destiny, destiny, and be able to have an example. Uh, that uh, I was able to bring something to the industry and that I was able to maintain uh, my independence. I, I, you know, I look at Herman Russell, you know, I look at, uh, at A.G. Gaston, I look at, you know, Dr. Bob Brown, I look at uh, uh, Don Peebles, I look at, you know, there are several examples of minority entrepreneurs that have been able to build uh, large sustainable business enterprises uh, as independent African Americans, and those have always been my heroes, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and I just just uh, think that it's it's something to be said uh, about entrepreneurs who are able to do that. I get you out here on this last question, brother. Um, your goal is to be the first uh, independently owned billion dollar black owned business. Um, how close do you think these fifteen years have brought you to the goal and? What are, what is the next milestone on that journey that you're that you're most looking forward to? Well, um, you know, and and let me say this: is the the first uh, hundred percent minority owned billion dollar contract food management company. Yeah, yep. Mm -hmm. um, and and so uh, what I have learned uh, about that over the past fifteen years, uh, ultimately, is that it will require uh, organic growth uh, strategy as well as uh mergers and acquisitions uh in order to be able to to, to get uh to that uh to that point um you know uh, i wanted to cut my teeth and establish myself in the historically black college and university market and uh the diversification outside of that uh has has historically been big government uh we are uh, also looking to uh and have been involved in some processes well, more recently, uh, that uh, we are uh, approaching very soon uh, some big announcements about, um, you know, some uh, growth and diversification uh, outside of, of, of what people have traditionally known us as. And so, um, you know, I hope to within the, you know, the next uh, 14 to 15 days, uh, be in a position to uh, announce that. Uh, so we're excited uh, about that uh, going into our 15th year. Um, and, um, you know, man, it's, it's just been, um, you know, it's been a roller coaster ride, you know, but uh, I wouldn't trade it for for anything in the world. You know, uh, I'm able to serve my people. Uh, I'm able to employ my people. You know, I'm able to uh, teach my people. Uh, and, um, you know, I, I can tell you I'm very happy, you know, uh, starting, you know, at 25 and turn 40 next month. Uh, this this um, 15 years has been a, a tremendous uh, opportunity for me. And I don't know if I had a chance to tell you that I'm actually writing a book. Yeah, so I'm actually writing a, a book uh, with uh, Blair Walker. Uh, you, as you know, Blair uh, wrote the Why Should White Guys Have All the Fun? Mm -hmm. and so we've been working over the past year, uh, just kind of chronicling my life and, and stories. And, and uh, it's really going to be centered around, um, you know, uh, my pursuit as an entrepreneur, some really fun, you know, um, stories uh, as well as. But it's really designed to, you know, push the next generation uh, to go out, step up, and build wealth and create jobs. And so uh, we look forward uh, to wrapping that up probably in the next couple of months. And uh, we, we should have a book coming out in 2021. Breaking news right here, man. You yeah, here. That's right. Um, brother, we're we going gray together. we putting on glasses together. we cutting that's all right. our hair off together. <laughs> I love you, man. I am so like proud too, of what you've done. Um, and I am so grateful for the role model that you are, not only just for me, uh, in my family, but for, for, for legions of students all over the country, man, best of success and can't wait to have you back on for these big announcements, brother. Thank you, bro. Well, you just continue to do what you're doing and, and serving as, uh, you know, a, a media outlet to tell our story the way it needs to be told. And, and we need you and, and we thank you and, 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 and bless you and 
the digest and your family and you continue to go out and do the great work that you've been doing uh, to represent all of us. Oh, before I let you go, plug yeah. the website so people will know. <laughs> you said <laughs> Buy food, plug your website, and everyone. Oh, oh, yes, absolutely. So, uh, PerkinsUSA.com. 